Esther chapter 7, and we're going to go through two chapters tonight, so don't panic. Uh, they're short, uh, but we'll get through it, and we'll have a great time. But uh, Esther chapter 7, and Haman, we saw last time, what was ordered to parade Mordecai around town. Now, we, we know, and but nobody else knows this, but, but uh, Mordecai, being the cousin of Queen Esther, they are Jews. And so it's, it's been known that Mordecai is a Jew, but up to this point, the queen, it's not been revealed that she is a Jewish, a Jewess, I, I should say. And so Haman, we saw last time, paraded Mordecai around town, and Haman was absolutely humiliated by this. And so let's come before the Lord and ask him to bless our, bless our study tonight. Thank you, Lord God, so much for allowing us to be here tonight. We thank you, Lord, for this great book, and we see clearly your faithfulness to the nation of Israel. And so we're going to see more of that even tonight. But we thank you, Lord, for Mordecai, for Queen Esther, and just all the characters in this, in this book of Esther, Lord. But we thank you that you are the main character, Lord. You are God, and so you are sovereign over all things. Let us be reminded of that tonight, Father God. There's nothing that happens per second that you are not fully and totally aware of. And so in that, Lord, we find great confidence as you reserve us for our heavenly realm. And in the meantime, Lord, fill us with your spirit to overflowing. Allow us to learn and then allow us to take these truths, Lord God, and break them apart for those that are looking for you, Lord God. And some people that we encounter don't even know they're looking for you. But Lord, just empower us through these times when we gather to break these things down for those outside these doors. Because we know that you desire that none should perish, but that all should come to that saving knowledge. And that saving knowledge is the relationship with your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. And we bless you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So after Haman had got back home, reported to his family what had happened, how he was humiliated and such, his family told him, said, Haman, your days are numbered. And so we pick up in Esther chapter 7, and we remember that <coughs> Queen Esther had invited the king and Haman to dine. And so in, in verse 1 of chapter 7, so the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther, as appointed. And on the second day at the banquet of wine, the king again said to Esther, what is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted to you. And what is your request? Up to half the kingdom? It shall be done. So once again, we see the banquet of wine. And the king here, he was quite a partier. We've seen him in very numerous occasions where he was tipping the glass. And so perhaps, and this is just my own suggestion, perhaps this was some knowledge given to Esther by the Lord as she was fasting and praying, Lord, how do I approach the king? How do I get to him? And, and perhaps the Lord said, hey, put a bottle of wine in front of him. Before you know it, you'll be eating out of your hand. I mean, that's just my own suggestion, but I can't get away from it because this is the second banquet of wine, and this is the second time the king says, hey, well, what do you want? I'll give you half of, half of the kingdom. And so that's pretty generous, but I'm kind of thinking that his heart is merry during these times. But nonetheless, that's just my observation. It's really not worth a whole lot. But the, so the queen answers. So the king says, hey, what do you want? The queen, the queen answers in verse 3. If, king, now we see the respect for his authority. Even though she, she's married to this man, but he is the king of the world. And so she very wisely, if. I have found favor in your sight, O king. And if it pleases the king, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. And so the king's kind of thinking, huh? what are you talking about? And she continues in verse 4, for we have been sold. And so at this time, the king's just thinking, what on earth is she talking about? My people and I to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. And so again, the king, he's just thinking, what is she talking about? 
you're to be destroyed and your people are to be destroyed. I mean, the, the king is just kind of wondering and, and not only killed, but completely annihilated. Had we been sold, she continues, as male and female slaves, I would have held my tongue, although the enemy could never compensate for the king's laws. And so at this time, the king has stopped everything that he's been doing, and he is intently listening to his queen. And he's hearing this idea of annihilated, in other words, wiped out a total loss. Now, this was the idea, of course, of Satan himself, to wipe out the whole Jewish nation. Because as we as we discussed previously, the Messiah was to come through the Jewish line. And so Satan thinking, well, if I could wipe out the line of the, the, the Jewish families, all the families, then there would be no recourse for Messiah and there would be no possibility for salvation. So this is the, the thinking of Satan himself, and he found a willing accomplice in Haman to truly, if given the opportunity, would have wiped out the Jewish nation. And we see how closely this has come. Haman had the gallows built. Not only was he going to hang Mordecai, but on the, the appointed date, he was going to wipe out, Haman had the authority to wipe out the nation. And so we see again how closely this scenario came to pass. But now the queen is just saying, oh king, you wouldn't let me and my people be wiped out. And again, the king's thinking, what on earth are you talking about? And so in verse 5, so king Ahasuerus answered and said to the queen, well, who is he? And where is he? In other words, who's the one that wants to wipe you and your countrymen out? Who would dare presume in his heart to do such a thing? You're my queen. So how dare that person even consider laying a hand on you and yet laying a hand on your people? I had no idea. So tell me more. And Esther said in verse 6, well, the adversary... And the enemy is this wicked Haman. Now, can you imagine? I mean, Haman's already had a tough day, or maybe a day previously, as he's been, again, parading Mordecai around through town. And then now he's at the, the banquet at the request of the king and at the, the request of the queen. And the queen now says, here's your man right here. Now, remember, Haman was the king's right-hand man, basically. And so the king's just like, what are you talking about? I had no idea. The adversary and the enemy is this wicked Haman. And so rightfully so, Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. And so the king gets this information, and it's just overwhelming him at this time. And so he's thinking, man, i got to get some air. And so in verse 7, the king rose in his wrath from the banquet of wine and went into the palace garden. And so arising in wrath, in other words, he didn't just get up and kind of wipe his hands on the napkin and say, oh, may I be excused, please? Would that be okay? I mean, he was mad. He arose in wrath, and so there's some commotion going on. So perhaps uh, the king jumped to his feet, Maybe his chair went sliding across the table or something. Maybe the, maybe the table itself was kind of being rattled and things, and some of the, the wine glasses were shaking a little, bit, a little bit. He arose in wrath. He was upset. And this is important because Haman is watching this response, just thinking, I'm a dead man. I mean, the king is upset. And so the, the king, again rises in his wrath, but Haman stood before Queen Esther. So in other words, Haman stayed in the room. The king is out in the garden. Haman stays in the room before Queen Esther, and then he begins to plead for his life. So the king is exited. He's out in the garden thinking, I've got to collect my thoughts. What has just happened here? My wife, the queen, and now my right-hand man, what is going on? And so he's trying to collect everything and, and, and sort it all out. And again, here, Haman is pleading for his life 
For he saw that evil was determined against him by the king. Because again, the king arose in his wrath. The king was not happy. And so this was obvious to Haman. I am in trouble. And so he's, he's begging the queen for his life. The queen is probably on the couch or on some sort of uh, comfortable chair of some sort. And here Haman, I imagine in my mind, is on his hands and his knees begging for his life. What a real hero, right? He's about ready to wipe out a whole family tree. And here he is now begging for his life as, as the, the, the true wimp that he truly is. And in verse 8, now when the king returned from the palace garden to the place of the banquet of wine, Haman had fallen across the couch where Esther was. And so I imagine once again, here as the king was gone, Haman is on his hands and his knees begging the queen for his life. And then perhaps he sees probably that he's getting nowhere. Now, don't forget the security people are in the room here with the queen because she's royalty, but she's not cried out for help or anything like that. And so the security men, they're kind of watching and standing aside, but she hasn't asked for them to intervene, so they're being courteous. And then perhaps Haman, uh, again, saw that he wasn't getting anywhere, so I'm thinking in my mind's eye that he maybe stood up and started saying, but, but queen, but queen, and then maybe in his haste he might have tripped, and at the time that he tripped and fell onto Esther, the king walks in. Perfect timing, huh? <laughs> Nothing in the scripture is a coincidence. This is the Lord. I mean, so here comes, here comes the king, and then the king sees this, and he says, will he also assault the queen while I'm in the house? Are you kidding me? I mean, so here, here the king is seeing this scene, and as the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. In other words, when the king came in and began to speak, said, is this man even going to assault my wife? That's when the security guys instantly jumped into action. That's all they needed. The queen didn't say a word, but when the king said, is he even going to assault my wife? The guys were on it instantly at, at the at the word of, of, the, uh, of the king. And so they, they jumped up, they covered Haman's face, in other words, they secured him. And in verse 9, Now Harabona, one of the eunuchs, said to the king, Look, the gallows, 50 cubits high, which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good, Mordecai spoke good on the king's behalf, it's standing at the house of Haman. And so Haman wanted to hang Mordecai. And King, you remember Mordecai was the guy that revealed that assassination plot against you. So Haman's the bad guy and Mordecai's the good guy. And so we've got this guy secured. And the king says, great, let's hang him on it. Let's hang him on the gallows. Now the gallows, we'll take a, a, a minute and kind of look at the gallows. This gallows that Haman had created was 50 cubits high. Now, 50 cubits in, in American footage would be approximately 75 feet. 75 feet is pretty tall. And so this is kind of an idea, a possibility of a gallows. Of course, at the end of the gallows here, there'd be a rope and such. And perhaps as the, as the uh, person to be hung, a lot of times they may be on horseback or, or standing on a... a uh, carriage of some sort, and then either the horse would be uh, moved along and, and the person would be dangling, would be hung, and, and such. But the idea of 75 feet high, the idea that Haman wanted to bring to the community and to Shushan, which we remember Shushan was the, the capital of Persia, Haman wanted to hang Mordecai very high so people would see it. That's the theory. That's the idea. I mean, Haman went to the extreme because Haman was so upset that Mordecai would not bow in the presence of Haman. So Haman says, I'm going to show you. So 75 feet was over the top, literally. It was way, way beyond what was necessary. But again, it would appear that Haman was trying, to, was desiring to make a statement 
not only about Mordecai, but also reminding the rest of the Jews, hey, in the 12th month, you're all going down just like your guy Mordecai here. And so as it turns out, the king says, hey, let's hang Haman up high, high noon. So in verse 10, they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's wrath was subsided. So tough day for Haman. And boy, events went quick, amen? I mean, he was, he was the top dog one day, and within 24 hours later, he's dangling by a rope. I mean, what a sad scenario. Galatians chapter 6 reminds us, the Apostle Paul reminds us, do not be deceived. God shall not be mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he will also, not that he will also, also shall reap. You know, we can't pretend and play games with the Lord. And you know many people, it might be family or it might be people you work with or whatnot, playing games with the Lord. And I mean, how many times have you heard someone say, oh yeah, I can't wait until I get into the presence of God, because I got a few things to ask him, boy, I'll tell you. He needs to straighten a few things out when I'm in his presence. How many times have you heard that? Isn't that a scary thing to hear? I frankly hate hearing that when I hear friends or acquaintances say things like that. Oh yeah, I, I want answers about this. You know, just, I'm just thinking to myself, and, and we try to reflect these folks, man, God has been gracious to you. God has blessed you. God has maintained you. But yet you still shake your fist right in his face. And again, God will not be mocked. Haman thought he was going to mock God. The Jews, as, as people knew about the Jews, they knew they were God, Jehovah-fearing people. And the Persian Empire was a very humanistic gathering of people. And so Haman, he didn't want any of this Jehovah business. He wanted things that were material. He wanted things that he could touch and hold. He wanted power. He wanted position. He wanted fortune. Remember he had gone back and reminded his family and his acquaintances how wealthy he was and how prominent he was and how the king had his hand on his, on his life and such. Remember that? That was very important to Haman. He wasn't interested in this Jewish God business, and especially when that, that Jew Mordecai wouldn't bow down. Oh, he's going to pay. We don't mock God and expect to get anything other than his wrath. He is merciful and he's gracious to those of us that seek his face. But if you want to wrestle with the Lord, go review Jacob. It doesn't work. Zechariah tells us, and sooner in the Lord's timing will be in Zechariah. But Zechariah 2 8 tells us, to the nations which plunder you, this is Zechariah prophesying to the nation of Israel, for he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. Zechariah speaking to the nation of Israel. Those who plunder you, Israel, just know that they are touching you, the apple of my eye. And the apple of our eye is just the colored retina of your eye. Have you ever accidentally stuck your thumb in your eye, or is it just me? Am I the only dork that does that kind of stuff? I mean, that hurts. And so we get the idea when the Lord's saying, when you mess with Israel, you're sticking your thumb right in my eye. I don't recommend sticking your thumb intentionally in the Lord's eye. And so again, we see God's faithfulness, and we're grateful for God's faithfulness to the Jewish nation. Because through God's faithfulness to his people, we can be knowing and secure that as we put our trust in Jesus Christ, God will maintain our salvation. Amen? And so God is not done with Israel. He's not given up on Israel. He's not replaced Israel. Thank God for that. Because if he did, I would consider us being in a place that we should be worried. 
or questioning our salvation. But that's not the issue. God has been faithful to Israel, and we're grateful for that. And so we want to stand alongside, as here at Calvary Chapel and as a body of Christ, we stand alongside with the Lord in supporting Israel. And so that goes throughout our own personal lives. It should be considered, should be considered in our politics, and that's up to you. That's between you and the Lord. But these are things that we need to consider, is that it's God's chosen people, as Pastor was teaching just the other day, God has grafted you and I as Gentiles into the tree of life, he could just as easily graft us out. But that would be a very difficult thing to have happen. Don't misunderstand. But the point of it is, the point of the matter is, is God is sovereign. And his chosen people, Israel, are those that we love likewise. And we're grateful for that. Now as we move to chapter 8, on that day, King Ahasuerus gave Queen Esther the house of Haman. So Haman's done, his family's done, the enemy of the Jews is done for the moment. And Mordecai came before the king, and Esther had told how he was related to her. So not only did Esther say, hey, I'm a Jew, Mordecai's a Jew, and we are related. Mordecai is my cousin, but yet he raised me like a father, is what he told the king. And so the king, the, the Esther is just taking the king's heart, saying, man, I want to see Mordecai once again. I didn't realize. Why didn't you tell me this before? Well, the timing wasn't right. Now the timing's right. And so the king's heart is just going out to Mordecai. He says, man, this is, this is my guy. And so in verse 2, the king took off his signet ring. Remember that signet ring is really the official signature of the king. Anything that was, was uh, stamped in the wax with the king's signet, man, that was the authority. That was it. So he gave. So the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman. We remember that ring was given to Haman previously. And he gave the ring to Mordecai. And Esther appointed Mordecai over the house of Haman. And so, things, so fortunes are turning quickly here in the Mordecai-Esther family. Of course, Esther was the queen, but in the Mordecai department, if you will. Now, Esther spoke again to the king. She fell down at his feet and implored him with tears to counteract the evil of Haman the Agagite and the scheme which he had devised against the Jews. Now remember, previously we had spoken when we introduced the book of Esther, in the Persian Empire, when a law became law, that was it. Not even the king could reverse it. It was literally stamped in stone. And so here Esther is coming, said, hey, there's been that, that decree, you remember about that. And so the, so, so the king, verse 4, held out the golden scepter toward Esther. In other words, she was welcomed in. So Esther arose and stood before the king and said, if it pleases the king, and if I have found favor in his sight. In other words, continuing that respect for the king of the world. If I have found favor in your sight, and the thing seems right to the king, and I am pleasing in his eyes, let it be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman, the son of Hamidatha, the Agai, which he wrote to annihilate the Jews who are in all the king's provinces. So Esther, the queen, is saying, is there some way we can reverse this? How can this be undone, is what she's basically asking. For how can I ensure, how can I endure to see the evil that will come to my people? Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my countrymen? And so everything is understood now by the king. Esther is a Jew, Mordecai is a Jew, and the king, in a bit of ignorance, literally, allowed the decree to wipe out the Jewish nation to go forth. And the king is really being convicted at this time. He loves his queen. He loves Mordecai. And now he's realizing, I've made a big boo-boo. How are we going to correct this? Then, verse 7, King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther and Mordecai the Jew, Indeed, I have given Esther the house of Haman. And they have hanged him on the gallows because he tried to lay his hand on the Jews. 
You yourself, you guys, you two, you yourselves write a decree concerning the Jews as you please. Make it in the king's name. Make it in my name. And seal it with the king's signet ring. Mordecai, you've got the signet ring, so see, make it official. For whatever is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's signet ring, no one can revoke. So you write up a decree. Put your heads together. You'll figure something out. And so in verse 9, the king's scribes were called at that time. So they got all the, the administrators together, and it was in the third month, which is in the month of Sivan, on the 23rd day. Now, Sivan is probably like May or June in, in our Gregorian calendar. And it was written according to all that Mordecai commanded to the Jews, to the satraps, to the governors, and the princes of the provinces from India to Ethiopia. And so this letter was being crafted to all that were in charge. And we recall there was 127 provinces in all. And so this was quite a territory. And you can imagine that many provinces, well, there were a ton of languages likewise. And so to every province, it, would be, it was to be written in their own script, to every people in their own language, and to the Jews in their own script and their own language. Now, can you imagine for a moment the administrative movement that had to be put together to do this. 127 provinces. You know, just right here in the Harupa Valley, how many languages would you imagine there would be? I mean, we could go to the high school or something and get a fairly good idea or go to one of the elementary schools. I mean, there's got to be at least three or four languages that are spoken here just in the Harupa Valley. And so we can imagine with 127 provinces, how many languages and how many scripts had to be written. And so this is a massive, major movement. And every person needed to know because this is a huge thing, obviously. The Jews were set to be wiped out on this certain date. Now everyone needs to know we're going to change that to a degree. And so this is a major, major movement. Verse 10, and he wrote in the name of King Ahasuerus, sealed it with the king's signet, in other words, Mordecai, sealed it with the signet ring, and sent letters by couriers on horseback, riding on royal horses, bred from swift steeds. I mean, this is a major operation. Verse 11, by these letters, the king permitted the Jews, here's the key, who were in every city to gather together and protect their lives. They got permission now to go on not only the defense, but even more importantly, the offense on this particular date. Before, these Jew, the Jews were just expected to shudder in fear as they were to come in, led by Haman, and just be wiped out. Now this decree is saying, hey, no longer are you just a shudder in fear. You are to prepare yourself for this battle. And they were given permission by the king. They were given permission to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all the forces of any people or province that would assault them. So this is directly from the king. And this was to both little children and women and to plunder their possessions. On one day in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, which is February, March, something like that for us. So this is the date that Haman had selected. This is the date we're going to wipe out the Jew. And so now this decree was saying, hey, on that particular date, you know what's going down, but now... You get to protect yourself, and you get to go on the offensive. Praise the Lord. A copy of this document, verse 13, was to be issued as a decree in every province and published for all people so that the Jews would be ready on that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. They were going 
to be ready. The couriers who rode on royal horses went out, hastened, and pressed on by the king's command. And so these guys were hot footing it. Man, they were moving out. And the decree was issued in Shushan, the citadel. Once again, the Shushan, the citadel was the capital, much like Sacramento is our capital here of California. So it was, it was issued in Shushan, the citadel, making it official, if you will. So Mordecai, as we begin to close here, went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel of blue and white, with a great crown of gold and a garment of fine linen and purple. And the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad. And so they saw him off. There were people lining the streets just cheering Mordecai as he's leading the entourage and just giving directions. Okay, you guys go that way. We're heading this way. And paper the, paper the province, <laughs> basically. And so everybody was, was just shouting, and, and they were glad. It was a great, it was kind of a... Uh, a re it was a, a major rejoicing time. And the Jews had light and gladness, joy and honor. I mean, they're, little, they're just praising Jehovah. Now in that, as the Jews were raising their voices unto Jehovah, wouldn't you imagine that those around them would begin to start thinking, hey, I think I kind of want to be on their team. Wouldn't you think? I kind of want, I want to be on your side. Can I join you guys? And the Jews are saying, absolutely. Jehovah is good. God will teach you about the Lord. And so you can imagine as the joy is just rising up to the heavenly realm, people are getting on board. And that's what the Lord chose the nation of Israel to reveal Jehovah God. And that's their job. And so it's happening here. It's happening here. We'll, we'll qualify that here in one second. And so gladness, joy, and honor, verse 17. And in every province and city, wherever the king's command and decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a holiday. We'll check that out next time. Then, and here's the key as we close, then many of the people of the land became Jews because fear of the Jews fell upon them. So they wanted to know. They knew something happened here. Something touched the king's heart. And they began to inquire, wisely so. And that's the Lord, isn't it? And so once again, throughout this book, we've not seen the, the name Jehovah. We've not seen the name God the Father introduced in the scripture. But we see God's providence, providence throughout these scriptures. Amen? I mean, what a joy and a thrill. If I could have the worship team come join me. What a joy it is to know that God is in the business of desiring to save people. So just as Pastor's been teaching us, as Peter went before the, uh, the, the community and, and preached Jesus Christ, people came to the Lord. Well, still, we see this same kind of a thing. I mean, the Jews were just saying, hey, our God is Jehovah, and he's powerful. And people started understanding that and said, yeah, your God is powerful. Because your God touched the king of the world, and your God melted the heart. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know that the, that the king came, came to Jehovah or anything, but his attitude should have changed about the Jew. And that's all that mattered. That's all God was after. Say, hey, you're a vessel. And so the nation of Israel being that vessel of Jehovah God. And that's why we're, we're, we're with the Lord. And we desire the Lord's will for the nation of Israel. Because that's their primary function, is to reveal who God is. And so who, who in the born-again body of Christ would be against that? None of us, right? I mean, we support that 100%. And so we're grateful. So we see more evidence of that, and we, and we find great joy in that. And so be confident in Christ this week, always knowing that he's got his hand on you. God loves you so much. I mean, take a moment to ponder that God sent His only begotten Son. God sent His Son, Jesus, to die for you and I. Yet while we were yet sinners, Jesus Christ died for you and I. That's an amazing thing. I know that we know that, but sometimes we just need to slow down and begin to meditate on that a little bit. Run that in our mind. Refresh ourselves with that reality. 
man, the joy of our salvation will just bubble up once again. And that's all God wants from us. He wants us just to love Him and turn around and bring that joy to a dying world. And He'll use our activity. He'll use, use our, our personalities to draw people to Him. So meditate on that as we close tonight. And let's continue to walk by faith, shall we? Join us by standing. Thank you.